Um, thanks, Ben, for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so in my excite excitement uh, for this talk, I sort of crammed in a whole bunch of stuff that I'm interested in that I'm excited about. Um, let's see how far I, I get into it. Uh, when I thought about the kinds of work that uh, we've been looking at, uh, I sort of broadly fall into three uh, big buckets for me. So one has to do with question answering, and the other uh, falls into uh, this bucket I call event knowledge, so basically modeling how events typically happen in the real world. And we just started getting a little bit of work in language innovation uh, and just one peck of a work in MP. Okay. So I thought maybe an assortment of these uh, bits of work would be useful. And the thing that ties these three areas for me is sort of, you know, given uh, the neural explosion, how do we think about models that basically allow us to reuse models that we've created for some task? How do we get these models to behave properly? How do we get some control over these? And uh, how can we do, um, how can we use techniques like decomposition, just basically breaking these models apart um, to achieve these goals? So that's my sort of verbose title and my explanation for what this talk is going to be about. So I'm going to dive right in. I'm going to start with uh, multi-hop text-based question answering. Okay. Um, rather than trying to define what this is, I'm just going to start with an example, right? So a question like this, uh, which city was Facebook launched in? Uh, the usual idea is that you're given some text where uh, there are different portions of this text that contain information that you should somehow combine in order to answer this question. Right? So in this case, you have one sentence that says Facebook was launched in Harvard, and another sentence that says Harvard uh, is located in Cambridge. So you combine these two things together and then conclude that Cambridge is the city where Facebook was launched. Right? So that's sort of the uh, you know, one example that probably illustrates what we typically mean when we say multi-hop text-based QA. So in this uh, problem space, I'm going to talk about um, three specific things. The first one is uh, touches on this idea of reuse, which is where we're going to think about um, this uh, problem of textual entailment and natural language inference, where we have many models that have been developed and apply it for doing this multi-hop QA task. And the second thing that I'm getting very interested in these days is this notion of whether uh, we, generate, we build these big data sets uh, that are supposed to test for multi-hop reasoning uh, but it's not clear if our models are indeed being hoppy. Right? Uh, so how do you know if your multi-hop model is hoppy? So that's, uh, that's a question I'm interested in. Uh, and the third thing is uh, it's not necessarily contained only for multi-hop QA, but in general, uh, the way NLP is progressing, we are getting bigger and bigger models. How do you get these models to operate on resource-constrained devices like mobile phones, for example? Right? So those are sort of the three uh, things that I want to talk about here. Uh, I'll start with the first question. Okay, so this is... Um, work that uh, was presented at NACL this year, um, led by my student Hash Trivedi, uh, and along with Ian Kwan, and uh, folks from AI2, uh, Tushar Kort and uh, Ashish Shabalwal. Okay. So this work really began with uh, sort of asking this question, like, look, uh, we have uh, these two big problem spaces in NLP. Uh, one is uh, entailment or natural language inference, and the other is QA. Right? Um, entailment, just as a, again, definition through example, you know, if you have something like Zuck studied in Howard, um, does this logically entail that Zuck lived in Cambridge, right? Um, so this sort of strict logical inference may not always be possible. There's always exceptions, et cetera. So um, you can think of a softer version of this where you can frame this as a natural language inference problem where maybe a bunch of reasonable people uh, looking at this might say, yeah, there's a possibility that if somebody studies in some place, uh, then probably they live in that place, right? So that's, again, it's not true in this case, but that's sort of a softer version of the same question, right? So uh, we have... Um, there's been some data sets, especially the uh, natural language inference data sets have been really big. Um, so uh, we have close to a million pairs uh, or something like this in these data sets. Um, there have also been uh, inference data sets that have been created specifically to handle question answering style problems. So there is some data uh, available for building these models. And you know, when it comes to actual models themselves, we have some choices, right? So there's been a leaderboard, there's plenty of models that have been developed for this. So there's some work on this space. That's all I want to say, right? Uh, in terms of multi-hop QA, again, um, we have lots of data sets that are coming up, uh, many different data sets. Um, and again, uh, with respect to models, we have some choice. Okay, so it's sort of, sort of in parallel, there's been develop, development in both these areas. The question we started with was, you know, how can we use these natural language inference data sets, right, which have been defined on sentence-to-sentence -sentence entailment or inference 
um, and how do we adapt them or use them for multi-hop QA, since you know, there's just some commonalities between these tasks. Um, so the question is, can we repurpose them? Um, in particular, if you have pre-trained models that work well on entailment, can we take them and use them for uh, the QA tasks, since these tasks are related? Um, so the basic idea would be we are going to look at um, questions where uh, we have some candidate answer choices. Okay, so we are given a question and a candidate answer, and we want our multi-hub QA model to sort of give a uh, score or give us uh, the likelihood of this answer, uh, given some textual knowledge as input. Right? Um, so the, what we want to do is to use some kind of a pre-trained entailment model to build this multi-hub QA model. Right? That's the objective. So... A simple framing of this kind of a QA with entailment, right, is uh, if I have a question, the same question we looked at, where was Facebook launched, and we have a bunch of choices. The first thing you do is you create some kind of a hypothesis statement that involves the answer, right? So I'm going to say Facebook was launched in Cambridge as sort of the um, hypothesis I have, um, which is going to support my answer. And I want to look for some sentence in the textual uh, knowledge that I have that supports this hypothesis, right? So the entailment question, that is how it's usually framed in the uh, entailment world, is does the information in the um, text or the premise sentence P entail the information that is asserted in the hypothesis statement? Right. So um, this um, is a simple example, but in the co context of multi-hub QA, what usually is present is something a little bit more involved like this. We have a bunch of sentences, right? Uh, that together should somehow support the hypothesis we have, right? So the entailment question now becomes, does the information in P1 through P4 together entail the hypothesis, right? Now, the entailment models and the entailment data sets are defined from single sentence to single sentence, but now we have a set of sentences to a single sentence, right? That's the gap that we want to scale. Okay, so you can think of you know, a couple of direct ways of using existing entailment models to handle this, right? So one simple way to do this is to um, aggregate independent decisions. So what do I mean by this? I take each premise sentence I have, and I take my hypothesis, and then feed it to the entailment model and say, okay, does this, you know, premise support the hypothesis? I get an independent decision, right? And I can apply this on each of the sentences that I have, and somehow aggregate these decisions together and give out, uh, uh, give out the final uh, conclusion. The other thing I can do is, like, you know, I'm going to ignore how the entailment models are trained. I'm going to concatenate all these sentences together and pretend it's sort of one blob of text, and then I verify if this blob of text together somehow supports the hypothesis I have. Right? So that's another way of using um, the entailment model. Basically, both are not very satisfactory. In the first case, you are not really aggregating information from independent uh, sentences. Right? If you make independent decisions, each sentence might only give partial um, evidence. Worse, uh, depending, because of the annotation artifacts you have in these entailment data sets, most of the times uh, you would actually get, uh, even when there is partial evidence, that it's actually not an entailment. Right? So this kind of independent aggregation doesn't make sense. Uh, on the concatenation side, again, as I mentioned before, there is a divergence in how these entailment models have been trained and how we are using them here. Right? So they're not used to seeing a bunch of sentences stuck together. So that's a really bad way to do this. And they usually get distracted because of the presence of uh, you know, other words that, that they shouldn't be using in making the entailment decision. Okay. So having looked at this, we said, okay, so what does multi-hub reasoning involve in, in such a setting? Right. Basically, you need, given a bunch of sentences, you need to identify which sentences, at least softly, right, contain the information uh, that is relevant to verifying your uh, hypothesis. And once you have identified these sentences softly, you somehow need to aggregate information in there and then use that to, verif to make that entailment decision. Right? So there's these two things you need to do, and I'm going to argue that both of them require some kind of an entailment capability. Right? The first one, where you're trying to verify if some sentence is, uh, you know, is likely to contain information that supports the hypothesis, is sort of an entailment-like capability. It's not exactly entailment. Um, you're basically comparing information in one sentence with the information in another. In the second case, you're comparing information with a bunch of sentences to the information in question. This, again, is also a form of entailment. Right? So, what we're saying is, like, let's, use the re let's reuse the entailment model to do both of these things. So we take the question and the text that we should use to answer this question, and we feed it through what we call a relevance module, which is going to process each of these sentences and then provide some kind of a relevance weight or a relevance distribution uh, over the sentences. And then we have an aggregated module, which is going to use these relevance weights and then produce the answer. Okay. The key thing that I want to mention is in both settings, we're going to use the entailment model to build these uh, two modules. 
Uh, so the relevance module is really straightforward. We're going to take each sentence and apply this entailment uh, function uh, to check with the hypothesis, whether the hypo information in the hypothesis is supported by it. Right? Of course, this is again a divergence from how the entailment model was trained. Right? So the entailment model was trained uh, to verify entailment, okay? but what we're using it for here is a sort of a subtly different um, use case. Right? We just want to see if there is information in the sentence that could be potentially useful when combined with other bits of information. Right? The idea is that hopefully if you do some fine-tuning fine on the target data set, the model will learn to do this. But the basic capabilities of comparing information in one sentence to the other is perhaps already encoded in the entailment model. Right? That's what we want to do. So this is straightforward, and it sort of aligns well with the sentence-to-sentence -sentence, uh, free training. Um, the aggregator, however, is a little bit more involved. Okay? So the aggregator basically uh, needs to take in uh, each sentence right, uh, and the hypothesis and the things that it should do are something like this. So we first need to get some representation of each sentence right, uh, with respect uh, to the information in the hypothesis. Um, and then we need to somehow scale uh, the information in each of these sentences based on their importance to answering this question. Right? So that's what we get from the first module. The relevance module tells us that information. So we want to scale this down. And then we need to aggregate this information all together and once you have this aggregated representation, then you want to maybe do some transformations and then make your final decision about whether this aggregated information supports the um, answer or not. Right? So that's what you want to do. And the key question then becomes, okay, we, our goal again right, is to use an entailment model to do all this stuff. Right? Um, so this aggregator is essentially doing the entailment decision. We have a pre-trained entailment function. Um, how do you get sort of these boxes that we need in the aggregator, right? The, the box in the lower half, they are trying to compute representation of each sentence. The one in the upper half is trying to do some kind of an entailment decision. How can we do this? Right? That's the question. So the way we do this is by pretending that our entailment uh, function is a loaf of bread, a sliced loaf of bread. Okay. Um, so basically, this is to say that we have multiple layers in the entailment model. Okay. Um, any other analogy would have worked, but uh, my student really likes uh, bread. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it could be a layered cake. It could have been anything. <laughs> but we go with bread. Okay. All right. So um, now we take this uh, pre-sized loaf of bread, okay, uh, which takes in premise and a hypothesis sentence and produces an entailment decision. And we're going to take a knife and slice this pre-sliced bread. Um, and we get these two parts, okay, the upper and lower half of this entailment model. So the idea is that you know, there is some lower parts of this that are computing representation of the input, and then the upper parts are doing something with the representation to compute the entailment part, right? So we can basically take these two halves and then uh, build our aggregated model. So the lower half is going to be applied to each sentence independently, okay? And we're going to get some representation out of this lower half. And the upper half is going to be, be applied over some joint of all the lower level representation that you've got, okay? And we're going to have the relevance weights that comes from the relevance module to scale these representations down. Right? So now, um, who knows what these entailment models really do, which layer captures what kinds of information. Um, there's no need to pick one particular place. You can slice this pre-sliced bread in multiple places. Uh, and we did it in two places, and then we got a aggregated module that looks like this. Okay, so. Uh, one place where we cut closer to the top, another where we cut closer to the bottom, and you get two kinds of representations out of this particular thing. Right? And then we can concatenate them together and do stuff. So I'll, I won't show detailed results, but this turns out to be useful. So you're having multiple representations is actually beneficial. And each of those also contribute, uh, you know, they, they both have their strengths, but combining them helps even further. Okay, so the full model looks like this. Okay, so we have a relevance module built out of entailment model, the aggregator built out of the entailment also. Uh, we call this model multi, uh, short for multi-layer aggregation of textual entailment representation. So the title uh, Hush came up with, uh, the acronym I came up with. Um, okay, um, so to fully specify this model, uh, I need to tell you what kind of entailment uh, function we used and where did we do the joins. Um, we used uh, this uh, stack called eSIM. Uh, it was uh, one, of the, uh, one of the strong baselines for entailment uh, pre-bird era. Uh, and this looks like this. Uh, we did the join uh, at two layers. We cut at two layers. One was at the cross-attention layer, which is basically computing attention across the premise and the hypothesis tokens. And then one just before the uh, final decision layer. 
Um, just to give you the join operation is not particularly complex. It's actually quite straightforward. Uh, in the case of cross attention, right? So with every sentence, we get a matrix, right, of attention by comparing the question uh, words to the premise uh, passage words. And for each of these sentences, we have the relevance weights, which are denoted by the alphas that we have here. Um, then we basically come, we multiply these uh, uh, attention uh, scores with these alphas, and then we do some renormalization uh, after concatenating them together. So it's a very basic operation. It's just combining the information that you have scaled by uh, the relevance weights that we get. Right. Um, and that's it. Um, so um, the paper has lots of details, but the sort of main questions we wanted to answer was uh, we began with this uh, statement that direct ways of using uh, entailment is not good. Uh, the short answer in the evaluation is that yes, uh, that our evaluation confirms that uh, this way of doing this is much better. Uh, and the next question is how does this compare with other QA models? We evaluated this on uh, two data sets, OpenBook QA, uh, which, is also, which is a multi-hub data set, and multi-RC, another one. Uh, we trained our multi-model, so the pre-trained uh, entailment function we have was pre-trained on uh, the SNLI and multi-NLI data sets, and then uh, we're fine-tuned on these target tasks. Um, so, at the time of publication, um, the model we have multi, which is shown by the green bar, was doing much better than the data, spe data set specific baselines we had, uh, better than OpenAI transformer, and then uh, comparable uh, to this uh, large transformer based model that was actually pre trained on a much larger uh, QA data set. So, there was this data set called RACE. Um, so, basically, you have a large scale language model that was. Uh, pre-trained on a large question answering data set, and then fine-tuned on the target data set. So we perform comparable to this huge model, uh, even though we didn't uh, train on those, uh, on those large scale data sets. A similar result holds for uh, multi-RC as well, uh, where the ensemble model actually of the, of the reading strategies paper does a little better than, than us. Okay. So those are sort of the main results. Uh, we also have ablations that showed that both the components, the relevance module as well as the um, Aggregated module are important, and that um, uh, doing um, sort of this kind of aggregation at multiple layers is actually helpful. So the question that I often get asked is like, okay, you know, how do you interpret this in the context of BERT? Um, really, um, the way I think about this is um, the, the big picture is you have, if you have a task uh, whose, uh, which is sort of structurally different from the target task, Right? So the pre-training task we have here is entailment, right? And the data set you have is sort of sentence to sentence uh, decision. And the target task we have um, has a different structure in terms of the input, right? So if you want to take a model and fine tune it uh, on this pre-training task and then, sorry, pre-train it on this uh, task and fine tune it on a different task with different structure, then uh, you can apply something like multi. So basically you need to figure out which components of the input are useful and how to combine them. Right? So this is sort of, idea can be applied to BERT-like models as well. So now BERT becomes our uh, entailment, uh, pre-trained entailment model. We can slice BERT up uh, and then apply the same idea. So we have some ongoing work on this. We don't have uh, any exciting results to put, but in, in practice, it's true. Uh, sort of, I've been speaking for a while. Uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, in between also. Okay. Right, so uh, sort of, uh, uh, so we did look at the relevance distributions that we get from the relevance module. So that's sort of a weak indicator of whether the model is actually using multiple bits of information in this room. So um, one thing that is very, so we do observe that in many cases it is placing weights on multiple sentences, but as we know, you know, this is not always clear if that is, that means that it's actually using all that bits of information, but at least the attention distribution is not Peak. But that said, uh, we played around with many different types of uh, constraints on the attention function. So you could sort of say, I want a peaky attention function. I want something that's much more spread out. Uh, we even tried at one point to have stepwise attentions where you can say, okay, wherever you attended to in the first step, you can't attend to in same place in the second step, sort of things like this. They all have huge impact on the sort of end result. Um, 
but not always in a good way. So it seems like just let them be is the right thing to do. We also had supervision on the um, facts that should be used to answer that question, right? So we can use that as a label for, as an auxiliary um, loss on training the relevance module, for example, right? So doing all those things seems to indicate, so that helps. So that to me seems to indicate that, you know, okay, maybe there are more things being used. But I'm gonna switch to the next part of the talk, which is going to get at the core of this problem. Great question. Okay. Um, what am I doing on time? Okay. Right. Um, right. So the things that I'm excited about this is right. Uh, I think um, you know we have certain capabilities uh, that we have developed for language. Um, I think we should do more to try and use those capabilities for the end task. And sort of to me, this is like at least one positive result where we showed that entailment is in, in fact useful for QA. And this idea of sort of picking things apart and putting them together in different ways, uh, pre-trained models in different ways to meet a target task is also exciting for me. Um, so I want to jump into this question about the small tech house model copy. Um, this basically started from this kind of uh, nagging thought, this, you know, is this model actually doing multi hop reasoning? Are these data sets actually requiring multi hop reasoning? Um, so we are interested, so we are, this is ongoing work uh, with, again, led by Hush and uh, folks from AI2. So the basic question is, you know, we have many multi hop data sets today. There's a lot of leadership, uh, sorry, leaderboard frenzy. Um, but it's not clear if progress on the leaderboard necessarily means that there is progress on the task. Right? Um, so the way we create uh, multi-hop uh, text-based QA data sets goes something like this, right? So you take a piece of text and you ask a crowd worker to actually look at the text and somehow come up with a question and answer pair that basically is supposed to guarantee that there is sort of two pieces of fact or more than, more than one uh, fact in the sentence that needs to be used in order to answer this, right? And the task definition then becomes something like this. You have a text, you have the question, you run a QA model, you get an answer, okay? So what is the sort of assumptions that we have underlying this paradigm of building data sets and task definitions? So the basic, uh, in terms of data sets, right, we sort of assume that more than one fact is necessary to answer this question. Having created the data set, this is something that we assume that, that is true. And uh, that all core facts that are necessary and sufficient to answer the question is in fact present in the input text, right? So the second one, I'm okay. I'm 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 not so concerned about, but the first one is really important, right? Um, so the hope we have for our models that are trained on these data sets then is that they will use the information that is in the input text, right? And will learn to do multi-hop reasoning if they learn to do well on these tasks. Okay. Um, however, the problem uh, is that these models can exploit, and they do exploit uh, any kind of reasoning shortcuts that might exist in these data sets, right? Um, and uh, they can, you know, like any uh, learning based model can exploit spurious correlations. So there's been a bunch of papers recently uh, from um, Chen et al. and uh, from, uh, from the group at Washington uh, and, uh, and Mohit Bansal's group um, that all show that, you know, these data sets may not necessarily require uh, multi hop reasoning and models can and do in fact exploit this shortcut. So the question we ask is like, what can we do, right? So the things we can do is study these models' behaviors very closely, try to understand what they're using, trying to interpret what peer inside. Uh, we could learn, if we, under, if we understand something about the kinds of artifacts that they are exploiting, uh, then maybe we could take that lessons learned and go back to the drawing board and say, okay, when we create our data sets, we're going to somehow avoid these reasoning shortcuts in the future, right? It's sort of a painful cycle to go through. Um, the other thing I, we are interested in sort of is trying to see if we could develop evaluation measures or some a way of uh, um, creating an evaluation that will guarantee that, uh, that there will be some measure of explicit multi-hop reasoning, not just question answering performance alone, right? Um, so, you know, going back to the data set and trying to ensure at the creation of data set that uh, you will cover all possible artifacts that a model can exploit is really not possible, right? This is an expensive thing to do. Uh, so we are interested in uh, this question of can you take an existing data set and somehow transform it so that you can guarantee that uh, models that do well on this data transform data set actually has to do multi-hop reasoning. Um, in particular, we have sort of two goals, right? We want to create data sets where non-hoppy models will necessarily fail, and we want to measure the multi-hopness of a model uh, and also perhaps using that come up with a way of measuring the multi-hopness of a data set itself. So the idea we're going for is actually very simple. Uh, if you have two facts like this that should answer a question, you could remove one of these facts, right? And if you remove this fact and replace it with something else, then a hoppy model 
it will fail because it's, you know, it doesn't have that necessary fact it needs to use to answer the question. Whereas a non-Huffy model that's relying on some kind of an artifact, like whether a city name is mentioned somewhere in the text, it might still give you the same answer. Right? Um, so basically for every question in your multi-hub data set, we can create uh, a version that uh, requires uh, the model to actually answer uh, that it does not know the answer to that question. Right? So you get uh, a original data set along with a version two, uh, now the question is, like, what, what kind of uh, measure that we should use here? So one thing we can do is to have this idea of paired accuracy. So you say a model gets a question right if and only if it gets both versions of the question right. So it should say that I don't know the answer to this question if a fact is missing, and if all the facts are present, it should return the right answer. Only if it gets both of these things right, you say that uh, the, the model uh, gets, gets a point. So to illustrate this, this kind of an idea can work. Right? What we did was we took uh, BERT, um, some rigged version of BERT, and we operated in two modes. Okay, one is what we call as the multi-fact mode, where we, where, give, where we give it the original passage, um, and it gives us an answer. And we also operated in the single fact mode, where we basically force BERT to use only one sentence at a time, and you get some answer from, uh, we get a score from uh, each of these uh, individual sentences, and then you aggregate this using a simple max operator. So the idea is that a single fact mode for BERT is not doing multi-hop reasoning, right, because it doesn't have access to the other bits of information, it just uses max, uh, so it can't know what the other, uh, what information is in the other sentences. Whereas in the multi-fact mode where it has access to all the sentences, you can assume that it might be doing some multi-fact reasoning. So if you look at the accuracy of these two models, uh, I'm sorry, I have the colors flipped here. Um, if you, the purple one is the single fact mode and the blue is the multi-fact mode. Uh, on the original data set, you can see that the BERT model operating on single fact, right, gets up to 49, uh, which is basically like five points away from the BERT model operating in the multi-fact mode. But if you use the paired accuracy measure, um, the BERT single fact mode actually gets zero. Okay. Um, so this is sort of a, an illustration that, um, you know, this kind of uh, transformed data set can actually penalize non hockey reasoning. Okay. Uh, the numbers, however, are not comparable to published BERT numbers, but this is sort of a uh, small experiment to illustrate the idea. Um, the things that I'm excited about here is, uh, you know, can we actually measure the happiness of a model? Uh, basically, if we can come up with uh, the best performance any non hockey model can do on this data set, and then you sort of take the delta with respect to this model, then you can say, okay, this is the uh, happiness of a particular model. Um, there's the other question that we are interested in uh, in this space is, um, how, do you, how do you know that a particular question or a data set requires multi-hop reasoning? Right? So this goes to, the, uh, uh, to, to a notion called the necessity of the facts. Right? So one of the assumptions we have um, in creating this multi-hop data sets is that the, the facts that are in the input text right, are indispensable to answering that question. Right? This is grossly violated when you have models like BERT right, or uh, other, model, other large language models that have been trained on large data. They might know one of these facts just from the pre-training itself. Right? So it raises a lot of interesting questions about how do you ensure that the questions that you're coming up with and the text you're coming up with does not have information that is already um, available to the language model. Right? Um, so we have some um, interesting, uh, at least what I consider interesting thoughts on this. So if you're interested, I'll be happy to talk to you offline. So the broader message, uh, I think um, I, there's uh, one person here who's expressing a, a, a sort of an interest in building reasoning data sets over text. I think this sort of broader message resonates with me even in that setting. Basically, we have this choice, right? We can create um, toy data sets uh, where we can artificially constrain the data set so that it actually uh, is impossible to do well on that data set without actually performing the specific kind of reasoning you're interested in. Right. Uh, the other extreme is we create natural data sets which, with the hope that this emphasizes many of the language problems. And in these data sets, it's hard to see if you can guarantee that the kinds of reasoning that you want the models to have is in fact present. Right. So there is sort of maybe an intermediary here where you take these natural data sets, uh, quote unquote, that you can create and somehow take the principles you've learned from these toy data sets and transform this large data set in ways that guarantees that the kind of reasoning you want is in fact present. Okay. Um, right. That's all I wanted to say about this uh, happiness business. 
I'm going to move. I'm going to move to the next section. If there are no questions. Okay. So this, um, I think, in the QA space, uh, in, in general, in NLP, we are becoming uh, the models are becoming bigger and bigger. Um, so sort of, we have some work that looks at how do you get these things to run um, on on the mobile device. Um, this again sort of brings to me like this sort of theme of how do you take something that's been trained uh, or designed for some particular setup and then repurpose it or decompose it to work in, in a different target setup. Like, so that's sort of the theme. Um, so this is some work uh, uh, we did uh, last year, uh, just measuring uh, you know the um, you know how long it takes for some of the uh, QA models. This is pre-BERT uh, to run on mobile devices, uh, mostly as is. Uh, you can see that for answering a single question, some of these models take as much as 80 seconds or 85 seconds. Like, so this is uh, not good. If you try to run BERT, uh, we tried to running BERT, the original version, it takes about 120 seconds. Um, if we can do some tricks and get it down to, uh, to tens of seconds, but uh, it still is a big challenge. Right. Um, so we have some ongoing work uh, trying to look specifically at large transformers um, to do faster inferences uh, for mobile devices. Um, so the first idea that you would think of is, okay, let's do some kind of a model compression, maybe some kind of a distillation idea, take the big bird and make it into a small bird or distal bird. Uh, the idea is if you have a small model, then you necessarily have smaller amounts of compute, and therefore you get some uh, improvements in speed. Um, turns out, at least in the experiments that we've been doing, um, we have a really high loss in accuracy in the end tasks. Uh, there's been some, a bunch of papers in iClear this year that are under review. Um, that all claim various levels of progress in this kind of distillation-based approaches, uh, but some of them seem to require pre-training, right? So if you have to do distillation, um, if you if you don't have to do pre-training on the original model, then that's a win. Um, so we can uh, we don't have to uh, spend a lot of time figuring out different speed versus accuracy trade-offs. Um, so if we look at the compute that happens in transformers, right? Um, I'm going to skip through these animations really quickly. Right. So the, if, you, if your uh, input is of length n, roughly um, the self-attention uh, complexity is n squared. Right. Um, this is the asymptotic bottleneck, basically, in, in transformers. Uh, the way we, we try to address this problem is by saying, OK, can we decompose uh, the computation that a transformer performs, especially in the self-attention layer, uh, as a sum of the local attention and the cross attention. So in the case of uh, question answering, we have a question and a passage. That's a natural boundary. Um, so the attention that happens within a question is local attention, and the attention that comes in from the passage is the cross attention bit. Right. Um, going to pause here for just a second. Uh, I think I've been operating out of the wrong presentation. I'll take questions while I switch presentation here. Sorry about that. Um, so, so the idea behind this work is basically, you know, like, do we need this full attention across all of these layers? Right? Um, there's been uh, some recent work that shows that uh, the lower layers uh, in models like transformers uh, seem to model more syntactic phenomena, which maybe <coughs> often uh, can be performed just with local context. You may not need uh, all of the uh, entire context of the input. Um, we try to test this slightly differently. Uh, so for the question answering case, you could say that if I removed cross attention from the question, then uh, if my paragraph representation doesn't change in the lower layers, then that tells me that I don't really need to compute full attention over the question and the paragraph. So what we did was we swapped out the questions. Okay? So we took a question and the passage from which the question was supposed to be answered, and then we sort of randomly plugged in other questions, and we looked at the representation that you get 
from the passage token, right? If that representation does not change based on what the question is, then that tells me that at, the, at those layers, I don't need to really worry about having full attention over the question, right? So in fact, as you can see, we're showing the variance of the passage representations sort of steadily grows, right? So at the lower layers, there is less variance, and at the higher layers, you have more variance, right? This is a little bit like reading tea leaves, but at least the general trend holds, right? So um, this supports this idea of saying, let's uh, avoid doing um, full attention at the lower layers, pick some layer for these large model, um, some layer K, until which we will compute the representations for question and passage independently, and then from that layer forward, we will compute um, the full attention, right? Because you, at some point, you need to compare these guys, uh, the question and the passage together. So basically, the passage attention becomes independent of the question. Um, this is actually useful uh, more than just reducing the compute here in terms of cross attention. It allows you to compute these passage representations um, beforehand, right, and cache them perhaps, and that gives you big savings, right? Um, the other nice thing about this idea again is that sort of the architecture of this model remains the same, right? So we're not compressing it down to fewer layers. We're not removing attention hedge, et cetera. It's sort of still the same BERT model, right? So the pre-trained weights we have can still be used on this model, and just fine tuning seems to be okay, right? So fine tuning actually only leads to a 3% loss in accuracy on squad, for example. Uh, we can do distillation techniques, like for example, you can say, look, the top layers of this uh, decomposed BERT model should behave like the top layers of the original model, right? So that's something that we would want. So we can come up with some layer-wise losses, et cetera, some additional tricks uh, that further improve the performance. So we get somewhere between 3 to uh, 3.5 speed up uh, with a loss of about 1 to 1 1.8 uh, in accuracy on, on a bunch of question answering layers. Um, so the big message here is that uh, models keep getting larger. We need to really think about how we can use these models uh, in ways that would work on smaller devices. Uh, and I think in this space, especially if you're doing anything with mobile, uh, measurement studies are critical. Okay, so it turns out, the, uh, for example, the attention is the bottleneck asymptotically, but really depends upon the input length you have. Right? So the feed-forward computations in transformers often cost much more uh, than the attention, depending upon the length of the tokens that you, length of the input sequence that you have. And I'm generally interested in this problem of, you know, how do you balance uh, local context processing versus full context processing? Right? So you can imagine, even in the non-mobile settings, uh, if I give you a book, how do you process a book through a transformer? Right? Do you need the entire attention? That seems like a bad thing. Um, there's other pieces of work that comes along, uh, like Excelet, for example, have a way of doing this, but they still have this sort of sequential dependence, which might make it harder to process. Right, so how am I doing on time? Five more minutes? 10 minutes? How much ever? Okay, very generous. Um, <coughs> okay, so what I want to do next is uh, talk a little bit about uh, the events, uh, pro event uh, work, work in the event sequence space. Um, so I should say a bunch of this work actually features uh, NOVA. Um, so uh, if you have uh, detailed questions, you can always bug him even, if I, even after I've left. Um, so this work uh, is about modeling uh, script-like event knowledge. Um, so one of the things that we would want uh, for our models to have is sort of access to how uh, events typically happen in the real world. Right? So you know, the classic example is the sort of restaurant script. You know, there's uh, Mary or Jane who goes and sits down, uh, orders some steak and scotch, tips the waiter and leaves, and then you can ask the question, did Jane eat? And you would say, eh, most likely yes. Right? So how do we say this, even though it's not explicitly said there? Basically, you know, we have uh, some expectation of how these events happen. Right? Um, so there's been a lot of work in the space, starting from you know, the original Shank and, uh, Shank and Abelson paper, uh, talking about declarative structures. Uh, but um, the sort of progress in this field has sort of gotten us to uh, event language models, rather than thinking about declarative structures, we now think about having functional models that can tell us what is going to happen in this particular scenario. Given some input sequences, we have predictive models that can tell us what is going to happen next. So, so what is the gap in the current uh, work? Uh, it's basically the gap is that uh, scripts are really hierarchical. Okay? So um, we have expectations on how events happen. Um, but then we also know that um, um, this kind of uh, knowledge is inherently hierarchical. So an example is that you might have uh, a script in your head for how what goes on in a restaurant, right, in a generic restaurant, 
Um, but then if you go to a fancy restaurant versus a fast food restaurant, what happens will vary a little bit. Right? And then within a fast food restaurant, if you go to a burger joint versus a pizza joint, maybe things will happen very differently. So basically, um, if you think about scripts, then they sort of have a lot of commonalities right, that's shared, but then there is also variation. Right? Um, so how do, we, how do we model this kind of uh, you know, hierarchy? Um, sort of we know how to do this in some way, which is basically to look at uh, variables with some dependence between them. Right? So we can have a latent space, uh, which is basically a bunch of uh, variables, uh, discrete variables, and uh, they have dependence between them that's supposed to capture this hierarchy. Right? So the top level variable might be modeling restaurant scripts. Uh, the next level is sort of modeling fast food uh, scripts. And then the third level is modeling burger and so on. Right? Um, we can basically use uh, an autoencoder uh, cell framework to do this. So how do you train a model that can predict what happens next? Uh, you basically give the model a sequence of events and ask it to encode it into some latent space and decode from that latent space to produce the same set of e events. Right? So that gives you a way to come up with an event language model. Except that in this case, we have a structured latent space, which is hierarchical in nature. Right? Um, so we also want a discrete uh, latent space. So uh, we use this uh, technique called vector quantized VAE uh, from this particular paper. Um, the basic idea here is that you sort of get a continuous encoding of your input but then you discretize it to one of the few points that you've chosen in the latent space that corresponds to the values that your discrete variables can take. Uh, the key idea here, in terms of how to handle the hierarchy itself, is just to use attention. Right? So what do we want? We want the top level variable, uh, let's say, to be uh, influenced by the content of the input sequence. Once you have made a determination for the top level variable, let's say you decided this is a restaurant script, then for the next level variable in the hierarchy, you want that to be influenced, the value that it takes on, to be influenced by the value you have set for the top level variable. Right? So we use the top level variable's value as the query to look at the encoded states and then use that to produce the value for the second level variable. So you can repeat this process and you get a hierarchical uh, assignment. Right? Um, decoding, once you have done this, right? once you have encoded into this hierarchical latent space, decoding can proceed usually as usual with any uh, decoding model you have that has the capacity to attend over the values that you've assigned for any of these uh, latent variables. Right. Um, so in terms of evaluation, we evaluated this with, uh, um, with a particular task we came up with specifically made to test whether uh, the, the, the scripts or the event sequences we generate um, model this notion of a hierarchy. Right? So for example, if you start with a seed event, police arrest man, and there are two possible branches this can go, right? Man pleads guilty, um, man denies charges, right? So, and then the subsequent events that should proceed on either branches should be very specific um, to the particular branch that you have, right? So um, we compared with a standard sequential model with some uh, role information. Uh, but basically, the hierarchical model, uh, it actually produces uh, branches that are more coherent with respect to the seed. Um, the branches don't have overlap, so the branch on the left and the right, they don't have overlapping events. And the information in each of these branches is very specific to that event, specific to that branch. Um, good things. Um, does the hierarchy capture the kinds of things we would want? Uh, generally, it seems like it. Like the top level, if you can take these uh, latent variables you have, and you can vary the value that you can assign to these variables, and you can see what uh, the model uh, decodes from those different assignments, you can see the top level sort of goes, uh, you know, at roughly uh, high level topics. Right? And at the bottom level, it seems to do something related to entities. Um, there's still not a sort of, it, it seems to do roughly the uh, kinds of things we want, but not really, uh, it's, it's not strictly hierarchical in how we would expect things to be. Okay. So the basic thing I wanted to say here uh, was that I think. Um, this kind of sort of structured latent spaces uh, are a great way, uh, I think, to to push uh, generative models to have the kinds of behavior that we want them to have. Um, there are interesting problems here on how do you supervise these latent spaces. So far, we only have um, the end task, which is basically reconstruction, to be our goal. Uh, we we are currently looking at um, other supervision signals, uh, like for example, can we ask causal questions of these latent uh, variables and sort of use that to improve uh, the event language model. OK. Um, I'll take five more minutes, then I'll talk about, um, I'll skip this piece of work. And I'll talk about uh, empty work here. Um, so 
So the key, so this work, um, the idea is to have, again, um, some level of uh, control uh, in, in translation. Um, so um, we wanted to see, um, we, we had sort of two goals. Right? So first is like, uh, can we use target site structures uh, during machine translation? Right? So uh, it's easier to see how you could do uh, encode. Um, if you're given on the source side, if you're given a sentence, then you could sort of extract some structure over that sentence and use that in the encoding process and then decode from it. But on the target side, um, decoding from that can be problematic, especially if you think about uh, latent variable models um, where um, if you think about a sequence of latent variables capturing some kind of a, um, uh, some kind of uh, structure, uh, this could be syntactic structure uh, or part of speech information, for example, um, then if you want to decode from this sort of latent variable space, um, if you have full codependence between um, the output words at each position and the syntactic choices or the latent space choices you have, then this becomes intractable. Right? So in practice, what people do often is to do this two-step decoding. Right? So first you say, given my encoded input, let me produce um, a possible set of uh, decodings for the latent space, and given those possible decodings, I will then decode into the target language. Right? So it's... Uh, um, it's basically sort of an approximation. But the thing is, if you are interested in um, some kind of a controllable translation where you want to say, okay, you want, I want you to translate this sentence, but then decode it into this specific part of speech tag sequence. Right? So for whatever purpose, maybe you want diversity, uh, maybe you want control for the length or whatever it is. Right? So if you have that kind of a goal, this two-step decoding is not really ideal because during training, the model is not exposed to all possible um, sort of uh, states of the latent space. Right? So we came up with a very simple, simpler model where we break the dependence between uh, the sequential la latent variables, so they are only dependent through the output choice that you've made at a position. The, the thing that you get out of this simplification is that now you can actually have a better exploration of the latent space, meaning for every possible value that the latent variable can take, you will have explored that uh, possibility during training, just because we've gotten rid of this uh, sequential dependence. So it turns out um, this produces better translations overall also, uh, and it also better at decoding from a specified set of uh, latent values. It uh, gives you a little bit more control. Uh, it could be useful for producing diverse translations as candidates like this. We have a transformer-based implementation of this idea, uh, where basically we have uh, the encoder uh, is the standard encoder, and then the decoder we has two branches now. So one branch is basically predicting um, the uh, value for the... Uh, predicting the probability distribution for the latent values, and the other is predicting um, the output, uh, output posi predicting the probabilities for the output words um, given, um, given or conditioning on all possible values that the latent space can take. Right? Again, um, this is a bit more work than what you would do normally, but it's still tractable because we can explore all possible states uh, at each position independent of the previous state. Okay. Um, so uh, on... Uh, on this on on the um, the IWSLT data set that we tried, uh, for example, we get like 1.7 improvements in blur compared to a basic transformer model, which was already better than many of the uh, published uh, published uh, results on that use target site uh, source site structures, for example. Okay, um, I will stop with that um, and sort of do a little plug for. Uh, NLP at Stony Brook, uh, we have a new AI institute that has come up. Uh, we have a you know, bunch of faculty that are doing NLP work there. We have core NLP, uh, human language analysis, uh, people studying NLP from network analysis side. Uh, we have a strong linguistics department also. We're hiring um, postdocs, faculty, uh, PhD students. That's it. Yes. No. So there's no, there's no specific. So the only thing is just reconstructing the output. It's naturally learned through that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the the basically the dependence that you have encoded seems to have 
I think Noah might answer this sort of if there are any special training tricks that he had to do to get the model to work that might have influenced the hierarchy, hierarchical behavior. I mean, first of all, it's not clear cut hierarchical behavior, or at least the scores grain stuff at the top and then sort of lower, maybe entity level information at the bottom layers. But I don't know if there's any training tricks that necessarily brought us that behavior. So I didn't talk about this though. So there's another work that uh, Noah did just before he left, uh, which is on um, generating narratives, um, where you're given sort of uh, first uh, sentence and let's say the last sentence, and then maybe some kind of sentiment transition you want in the story, and then you want a model to decode out of this. There, if you have, so we, we sort of have two sets of latent variables there. One is uh, relating to the sentiment transition at uh, each point in the story, and the other sort of tracks how the story state itself evolves. Right? In that case, having the sentiment supervision is actually more, much more helpful. Um, but even without that, you still get benefits. So it seems like if you have some inductive bias encoded in the structure, there is some juice you get. But if you want perfect behavior in terms of the inductive bias you have, then you need to provide some label. Yeah, so we, the, did we get the sentiment label automatically on that though, right? Yeah. No, I think we, uh, the goal was more more so on the generation side, right? Like, so can you have can you have a generative model that can subscribe to a specific plan you give, right? And have uh, uh, and also sort of account for a smooth, coherent transition in the scaffolding space that you choose, right? So right now we chose sentiment, but it's more on the generation side, less on the being able to classify the ending state. On this one, you heard, um, like what, for fun? <laughs> yeah, we do, so, I mean, we do have a QA system that runs on the phone. We have multiple versions, we, we edit those models. We do have stuff that runs on the phone, but um, one of the applications that we are trying to push for uh, is sort of being able to do device by QA. Right? So if I, this is again for private things and all this stuff, like I want to be able to have a QA system we are trying to build something that is this, but there is this other whole thing about storing the data, having access to that, so that's sort of doing some, but we don't have, like, for example, an application in that. Thank you.